Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Special Grips Forum. My name is Izumi Ono, professor of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Study, Grips, specialized in international development policies. I will be serving a moderator today. Grips Forum aims at informing policy debates by inviting leaders in various fields. It is a public event, at the same time gives our students opportunity to join and benefit from the lectures and discussion. Today, we are honored to invite Mr. Haruhiko Kuroda, who is now GRIPS professor and senior fellow at the GRIPS Alliance as a speaker of the special GRIPS forum. As everybody knows, Professor Kuroda served as the 31st governor of the Bank of Japan with his term spanning 10 years from March 20, 2013 to April 9, 2023, just until three months ago. Moreover, Professor Kuroda had a long-standing career at the Japanese Ministry of Finance, including Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs during 1999-2003. He also served as a president of the Asian Development Bank, ADB, from 2005 to 2013. Through nearly five decades of professional experiences in various capacities, he has witnessed the rising importance of Asia in the world economy and dramatically changing economic relations between Asia and Japan. As a prominent policymaker and a leader of the international finance and development community, he played a key role in building a stable and resilient international financial system, including coping with Asian financial crisis in, in the late 1990s, and then promoting cooperation to achieve sustainable development, particularly in the Asian region. For this reason, we are very delighted that Professor Kuroda will be teaching at GRIPS starting this fall, sharing his rich experiences and knowledge through education and research. But many of us cannot wait until October, can you? Therefore, we have asked him to give a special lecture ahead of schedule. So we are very grateful that he kindly agreed to speak today on the topic of Asian economy and Japan. This is a timely topic. Currently, we are facing multiple crises. In the middle of these crises, Asia has shown resilience and is reviving growth and the region is expected to be a driving force behind the global economic recovery. I remember at the time of his presidency of ADB, ADB published a report called Asian Century for 2050, which projected that Asia would account for more than half of global GDP by 2050 and outlined the opportunity and challenges. Given the critical importance of Asian economy to Japan and the world, it is highly valuable to listen to his latest perspective on this topic. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Haruhiko Kuroda. He will talk about 45 minutes. Then we will have panel discussions inviting groups, professors, and students. Because we anticipated active, heated debates, discussion in the panel discussion, uh, we will not be taking questions from the audience. We sincerely appreciate your understanding, but we will record the presentation and make it available to the public later. So, Professor Kuroda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, uh, Professor Ono. And also, I appreciate all of you for uh, coming to the GRIPS and participating in the GRIPS forum today. I would uh, talk about uh, Asian economies and Japan. 
And uh, also, I would like to discuss with uh, GRIPS professors and students about the future of the Asian economies and Japan. Asian economies and Japan established close relationship with each other, particularly after the Korean War, which uh, lasted from 1948 through 53. Initially, Japan was the growth center in Asian economies, and the East Asian economies achieved rapid economic development with trading with Japan. The Japanese economy started to slow down in 1970s, but then Japan's direct investment to East Asian and Southeast Asian economies soared in 1980s, contributing to rapid growth in those economies. Since 1990s, East Asian and Southeast Asian economies continued to grow while the Japanese economy became stagnant after the bursting of the bubble. I will focus on Asian economies and Japan in the last 30 years and discuss about their challenges ahead, uh, ahead uh, probably for the next 30 years. First, uh, I would like to uh, speak about Japanese economy and and Asian economies uh, until 1990. Japan's high-speed growth in 1956 through 70 was really spectacular. Its GDP growing by 9.6% on average. That means that during the last, during those 15 years, uh, the Japanese economy grew every year, on average, close to 10%. The growth was brought about by more than 10% annual increase of labor productivity in the manufacturing sector, coupled with 2 to 3% working age population increase every year. Export volume annually increased more than 5% each year during the period. In particular, iron and steel Ships and machineries export increased quite rapidly, while textile export declining. Major export market was the United States, and major import sources were East Asia, thus spreading economic growth fast to the so-called knees, newly industrialized economies like South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and then to ASEAN, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, and so on and so forth. This happy situation changed from 1971 when President Nixon announced to abolish gold convertibility of the dollar on August 15, 1971, ending the fixed exchange rate system and strengthening the yen from 360 yen to the dollar toward less than 300 yen. Japan's economic growth decelerated toward uh, 4 to 4.5% in 1970s. However, East Asian economies, particularly Southeast Asian economies, continued to grow by 8 to 10 percent in 1970s. After the oil crisis in 1973 and 79, Japan experienced double digit inflation but contained it by 1980. However, the US continued to suffer from inflation in the early 1980s with the dollar appreciating due to short-term interest rates at above 20%. Afraid of US protectionism, Japan and Germany agreed to appreciate their currencies by selling the dollar and purchasing their respective currencies. 
That was the Plaza Accord of the G5 on September 22, 1985. The yen appreciated was 200 yen to the dollar from 300 yen, which was certainly far more than anticipated by G5 countries. Therefore, to stop the dollar from depreciating further, G7, in reality G6, because Italy uh, opted out from the G7. Uh, so G6 agreed to maintain exchange rates around the current levels. On February 22, uh, 1987. But under this so-called Rubel Agreement, the dollar kept depreciating to around 130 yen to the dollar by 1987-88. So during 1980s, Japanese companies made huge direct investment to East Asia to shift some manufacturing production there, helping East Asian economies to grow by 6 to 8% in 1980s. Also, because of substantial monetary easing or fiscal easing, the Japanese economy grew by 4.8%, close to 5% in the late 1980s, while creating a huge asset bubble. So from now on, I would like to talk about uh, uh, Asian economies, 10 Asian economies, in the last uh, 30 years. The Japanese economy uh, experienced so-called bursting of the asset bubble in early 1990s. Since then, Japan's average growth rate decelerated significantly and stayed around 1 to 1.5% in 1990s and 2020s. So uh, this is uh, per capita GDP growth of Japan. And when uh, yen appreciate against the dollar, uh, of course, uh, nominal GDP per capita would rise. But when yen uh, depreciate against the dollar, the uh, dollar level uh, uh, GDP per capita would decline. So huge. Uh, fluctuation of per capita GDP in Japan uh, had been caused by huge fluctuation of the dollar yen uh, exchange rate. And the trend is very uh, slow, uh, probably only 1.5% uh, per capita GDP growth. Now, the most amazing growth per capita occurred in South Korea and Thailand in 1990s to 2020s. Of course, uh, there are some dent in Korean per capita GDP. This is caused by Asian financial crisis, and uh, that is caused by the Lehman crisis and the global financial crisis. But uh, the per capita income in Korea continue to grow. And also per capita income in Thailand, the double uh, lines show the Thailand uh, per capita uh, GDP. And interestingly, uh, per capita income uh, or per capita GDP in 1990, uh, uh, Japanese uh, per capita GDP was uh, 2,500, 900, uh, or 2,500, uh, sorry, 25,900 uh, dollars. And uh, South Korea, only uh, uh, 6,600 US dollars, and Taiwan, 
uh, 8100 uh, US dollars. But now, in 2022, the per capita GDP in the three countries are almost the same. Uh, same around uh, uh, 33,900 US dollars, something like that. And I must say that the uh, South Korean and uh, Taiwanese uh, medium-term growth potential is still around 2.5%, according to the IMF or uh, ADB's uh, uh, analysis. While Japan's uh, potential growth rate is now slightly less than 1%. Of course, the government intend to raise medium-term growth potential toward 2%, uh, but uh, it has been quite difficult and uh, still the IMF uh, says that uh, probably the Japanese uh, medium-term potential growth rate would be uh, 1% or slightly less than 1%. And since the uh, Japanese population is uh, declining by maybe 0.2 or 0.3% every year, so per capita income may continue to rise slightly more than 1%, but it's very uh, slow. While uh, South Korean and Taiwanese uh, Pakistan GDP would continue to rise. Uh, so uh, from uh, this year, per capita GDP in South Korea and Taiwan would be uh, higher, larger than per capita GDP in Japan, and that uh, would continue uh, for the next uh, 5, 10, or 15 years. Uh, Japan, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, would be overtaken by South Korea and Taiwan, and uh, relatively speaking, Japan could become poorer uh, in, in coming decades. Now, uh, the third group is, is uh, this one. This is Malaysia, and uh, rapid rising line shows China. So uh, both countries now have per capita GDP at around uh, 13,000 US dollars, almost overcoming the so-called middle income trap and moving toward high income countries. Their medium term growth potential may have slowed down, but will uh, still be around at 4%. Again, this is uh, uh, calculation uh, made by the IMF and, uh, and uh, ADB. So uh, the gap uh, between uh, South Korea, Thailand, uh, Taiwan, and China, Malaysia, this gap may uh, gradually uh, uh, become uh, less than uh, uh, as they are, that is to say the gap uh, would be gradually uh, reduced. But the gap is still quite, quite large. So uh, I'm not quite sure when, uh, for instance, Chinese or Malaysian per capita GDP uh, catch, catch, catch up to uh, South Korean and Taiwanese uh, per capita GDP, but still uh, they are growing uh, very rapidly. Now, this uh, line 
with uh, triangle shows uh, uh, Thailand uh, per capita GDP. And uh, Thai uh, per capita GDP grew slowly compared with almost other, all other East Asian and, and South East Asian economies. Now with its uh, per capita uh, GDP around uh, 7,600 uh, US dollars, Thailand may still be uh, captured in the middle income trap. Then uh, the, these uh, three uh, lines show uh, uh, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Uh, particularly amazing is the Vietnamese economic growth in the last uh, uh, 10 to 15 years. But anyway, these three countries, uh, their uh, per capita GDP is around uh, 4,000 to 5,000 US dollars. But their medium term potential growth rate appears to be 5 to 6%, again, according to IMF and ADB's uh, analysis. And their population is still growing annually by 1 to 2%. And their average age is 25 to 30 years old, so that working age population is abundant in these countries. So probably their per capita GDP will catch up, catch up the, the Thai level within a few decades. The last line is uh, India's per capita GDP, which is still around 2,400 US dollars, but its potential growth rates appear to be seven to 80 percent, which may last for the next few decades, supported by abundant labor supply and room for catching up developed economies. So India may become the next growth center of Asia, as well as of the world. Now, in coming years, Asia uh, or Asian economies may be faced with a number of challenges, including geopolitical tensions, aging population, climate uh, change, uh, and, uh, and uh, water shortages. So uh, I hope you can uh, clearly see those figures, uh, it's a bit uh, complicated, unfortunately. But anyway, uh, the first uh, challenges Asian economies may uh, face uh, in coming years and decades, or even decades, uh, are related to uh, geopolitical tensions uh, heightening in the Asian region. Asian economies are now so much dependent on their trade with China. For, for most of them, uh, uh, sorry. For most of them, uh, China is the largest export market. Uh, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and Philippines, uh, for them, uh, US is uh, still larger uh, than China as uh, export destination. But if you look at uh, import sources, then all of those countries uh, have China as the largest import source. So. Uh, Asian economies, uh, these uh, major Asian economies, 
are so much uh, dependent on trading with China. Uh, so uh, the uh, rising tensions in uh, Asia, rising geopolitical tensions in Asia, uh, led by, of course, the United States and, and China, but affecting uh, Asian economies, it's uh, quite quite uh, significant. Uh, why? Uh, because China has become militarily aggressive in South China Sea and Taiwan, and uh, in some sense challenges challenged uh, technology and security leadership of the United States. And uh, as uh, a sort of hegemonic state, the U.S. responded uh, uh, very quickly against uh, China in many ways. So, uh, like or not, geopolitical tensions between China and other Asian countries uh, have also heightened. So unless China softens uh, aggressive military actions and mitigate uh, challenges against the United States, uh, like or not, Asian economies might be forced to reduce trading and investment relationship with China. And that could reduce uh, their potential growth rate. So this is quite uncertain, but uh, we have to uh, acknowledge that the geopolitical tensions are rising in Asia, particularly East Asia and Southeast Asia. Second challenge is uh, population shrinking and aging in those uh, countries. The uh, population, this is a population increase. Uh, Japan and uh, Taiwan populations are declining already. Uh, South Korea, uh, this uh, shows a positive sign, uh, basically 2022 or 21. But according to the government uh, statistics, uh, South Korea uh, has already uh, its population declining. Not only uh, working age population, but total population uh, is uh, declining. And uh, also to be noted is China. Chinese population still increasing, but as you may know, uh, Chinese working age population is declining. And also, uh, average age of its population is very close to 40 years old, like uh, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. While uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, and India, their population uh, uh, Populations are still increasing more than 1%, and average age of their population uh, is uh, still, most of them still less than 30 years old. Even in uh, Vietnam, it's close to 30 years old. So, uh, if this trend continues, particularly in China. Chinese economy is so important in Asia, but uh, given this uh, population trend, uh, Chinese uh, potential growth rate might decline toward two to three percent in the next decade or next decades. Uh, this is a matter of uh, heated discussion, not only in China, but also at uh, ADB, IMF, and uh, various uh, international organizations. Some uh, economists are 
quite uh, pessimistic about the long term uh, growth potential of China. But recently I met a famous Chinese economist coming to Tokyo, and he told me that uh, probably in the next 10 years, Chinese economy can grow by 5 to 6 percent. Of course, in the very long run, a potential growth rate may uh, decline toward 3 percent, but uh, the next 10 years, uh, 5 to 6 percent growth is possible with appropriate economic policies. That is his <laughs> a proposition. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, the third challenge is climate change. Climate change, uh, uh, which brings about extreme weather, for instance, flood, drought, heat wave, sea level rise, and so on and so forth, all over the world. And this uh, uh, extreme weather is caused, basically caused by global CO2 emissions. And Asian countries emit CO2 in large amount. Uh, this is uh, uh, total emission, uh, uh, CO2 emissions by uh, 10 countries. Uh, and uh, this is a million tons. And the largest is, of course, uh, China. Uh, but uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, and India, uh, they emit a significant amount of uh, CO2. Uh, of course, uh, by uh, per capita uh, CO2 emissions, uh, not million ton, but ton, uh, the figure may be somewhat uh, different. Uh, for instance, uh, Indonesia or India per capita, uh, CO2 emissions are relatively small, while uh, Japan, South Korea, and China per capita, uh, CO2 emissions are fairly large. But of course, uh, what matters for the global uh, climate change is total CO2 emissions. So anyway, all uh, Asian countries would be required to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. As you know, the international community uh, has agreed to have uh, carbon by 2030 and be carbon neutral by 2050. So, uh, when I was uh, president of the ADB uh, from 2005 through 2013, I very much emphasized that uh, Asian countries uh, must uh, uh, strengthen or increase substantially uh, infrastructure investment in renewable energy, energy efficient uh, transport system and energy saving cities. And these are the most crucial uh, infrastructure investment to be made in the next uh, 20 to 30 years. And of course, uh, with the help of ADB, uh, these countries, particularly developing member countries, are increasing uh, uh, such investment, but I think uh, uh, these uh, infrastructure investment uh, are still uh, insufficient to substantially reduce uh, CO2 emissions in Asia. So uh, this is a big challenge for Asian countries. Uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, all these uh, uh, infrastructure investment uh, in new technology and new facilities uh, could raise uh, potential growth rate, but might reduce potential growth rate. Uh, we are not still quite certain what would be the long-term uh, implications to uh, economic growth, particularly per capita income growth in Asia of 
the uh, climate change mitigation efforts uh, to be made by those countries. And uh, finally, uh, you may think a bit uh, uh, strange, but I must say water shortage is another challenge faced by Asian economies. Again, when I was ADB president, I recognized that along with climate change, water shortage was one of the most serious challenges faced by many Asian countries. Per capita uh, water resources shown the, in the extreme uh, right, hand, right hand side uh, uh, column uh, shows the per capita water resources. By the way, uh, the, the, the earth uh, <laughs> contains huge amount of water, yes. But 97% or more than 97% of water uh, is uh, salt water, seawater. And only 2 to 3% of water is uh, pure water. And uh, of course, uh, countries like Singapore uh, has uh, desalination facility to produce uh, pure water from seawater, but it is very costly and uh, could not be used for agricultural production. 70 to 80 percent of pure water is used for agricultural production in the world. So that means that uh, water shortage would be uh, instantly uh, translated into food shortage. This is really a serious problem because the population continues to increase uh, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. And uh, so uh, particularly the, the per capita water resource, uh, particularly South Korea, China, and India, uh, they have uh, relatively a small amount of uh, per capita water resources. Of course, uh, they can import foods, but uh, globally, water supply is limited. That means that uh, food uh, production is limited. And uh, those uh, water shortage countries can, of course, import more foods uh, from uh, water abundant countries like, uh, like uh, Brazil, uh, Canada, uh, and Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on and so forth. But terms of trade would worsen for water shortage countries like South Korea, China, and India. I, I have not uh, uh, shown uh, the per capita water uh, supply, water resources uh, in, for instance, Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is one of the uh, most uh, seriously affected uh, by water shortage uh, countries in Asia. And uh, this has created a lot of problems in Pakistan. But uh, I'm afraid India is soon uh, faced with a serious water shortage situation. Of course, the uh, Indian government has uh, some national plan to uh, preserve water. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid uh, these may be uh, still uh, insufficient. 
I, I must say that uh, water saving, including avoidance of water pollution and water leakage, uh, must be uh, intensified in those countries, uh, particularly South Korea, China, and India. This is uh, a serious problem. Uh, but unlike uh, uh, climate change, uh, this uh, water shortage problem has not been uh, uh, well uh, recognized uh, by uh, politicians and, uh, and, uh, and uh, policy makers. I think uh, this must be uh, well known and, uh, and policy makers uh, must uh, intensify their effort to save water uh, in uh, those countries. So uh, I have uh, talked about uh, the economic growth in the 10 countries. By the way, I, I omitted uh, some uh, smaller countries and also uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. Hong Kong and Singapore per capita GDP is much higher than, 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 uh, sorry, uh, than Japan, much, much higher. But uh, Hong Kong and Singapore are relatively small city states with uh, financial center. So I omitted them. Uh, and also, there are uh, quite a few small, uh, uh, medium-sized, uh, uh, low-income countries. Uh, they are also quite uh, relevant and important, but uh, for the Comparative uh, analysis or comparative uh, uh, pro uh, explanation, I omitted those uh, low income countries, smaller low income countries, and uh, smaller city states like, uh, like uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. Anyway, uh, then I uh, talked about uh, challenges ahead uh, in those 10 Asian countries, uh, geopolitical tensions, population aging, uh, climate change uh, mitigation, as well as uh, water shortages. Of course, these are not a complete list of challenges. There may be various challenges, uh, domestic and regional, but uh, from my uh, understanding, these four are uh, quite serious uh, challenges faced by those uh, Asian countries and Japan. So final uh, comment, uh, um, my remarks may have sounded uh, somewhat uh, pessimistic toward Asian countries, but uh, I am really uh, cautiously optimistic about Asian people's ability and determination to overcome various challenges ahead. They have uh, uh, overcome uh, in the past uh, 30 years or so various challenges they uh, faced with. And so those challenges uh, faced with, uh, they can uh, overcome those challenges. And I really hope uh, you, uh, particularly graduate students uh, from Asia and Japan, 
will contribute to overcome these challenges and to achieve peaceful and prosperous Asia in coming years. Thank you.